Hi, I'm Jen Blatz, and I'm one of the co-founders of UX Research and Strategy. I have Lori Whitaker and Lauren Singer here with me today as well. And this is some special thank you bonus footage for North Texas Giving Day. This is a huge shout out of thank you to all the, those who donated to keep us going into 2020. Thank you very much. All right, so um, first of all, you can definitely find us on all kinds of social media. We're on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So definitely make sure to follow us for updates and for um, new materials that we post all the time. And if you didn't know about us and you just happened across this video, um, our whole mission is about bringing actionable and um, concrete examples to people who are interested in learning more about UX research and strategy methods. So we hold monthly meetings in order to accomplish this and we have gone global since COVID-19 hit. Um, we were focusing in North Texas only, but now we boast a community mem membership of over I like thousands of people. I won't even very put a number to it because it probably will change by tomorrow. Um, but we are um, so very happy to be able to continue our mission with your donations. So where are these questions coming from? Well, I did a webinar back in April, I believe, about how to master your UX job interview. And if you're interested in watching that, we have it on demand on Vimeo. Just look for UX research and strategy on Vimeo. I had so many good questions that I couldn't even begin to answer them all. So we thought we would take a moment, us three UX professionals here, take a moment tonight and answer some of those questions from our perspective. So the first question goes to Lori. All right, so how do you talk about your UX research and strategy process during the job interview? The most important thing is to tell a cohesive story, not just a story, a cohesive one. Um, give examples about how you worked on a project. What did you do? What was the outcome? Um, why did you choose to do the things that you did? And how did you work with others on that project? Because none of us, especially the three of us, see like none of us work alone. We are always partnering with product managers, designers, developers, it, anybody on the team is a partner with us. Tell me, tell me about how you've partnered with them. Um, show examples if you can. Sometimes it's kind of hard to get examples of, of work, especially research. Nobody wants to see your discussion guide, um, but they do want to see your thought process. How did you synthesize that information? How did you come to those conclusions that you came to? And then tell me the story about how you sold those conclusions to your business partners, because that is a very crucial part of being a UX researcher. All right, next question. Jen. How do you gain experience if you can't get a job? And we get this question a lot. I'm out of school, just out of college or out of a boot camp, and I don't have a lot of clips in my portfolio. Or I'm transitioning from academia or another field, and I don't have UX clips. How do I get them? Well, there's a lot of ways that you can get clips in your portfolio. A couple sources that I really like are Taproot. Taproot is an organization where you can join a team and you're partnered together to solve a problem for a charity or nonprofit. Usually it's rebuilding a website or making it mobile friendly. And that's a great resource, not only to meet people and to network, but to build a portfolio around a cause that's good. Also, catchafire.org is a website I've even used them myself, where again, a non-for-profit or after-school program is the, is the particular one I worked on. You can sign up for their project and give them some UX research advice or UX design and build out your portfolio. You can also volunteer. And I know you hear, oh, don't work for free. Well, don't volunteer for a large company necessarily. Volunteer to redo your local church website or build them a website. Volunteer for uh, like a local charity, a local nonprofit, a small mom and pop shop, like a local small business volunteer and make that UX project what you need it to be. 
Don't just do high, pretty, high res, pretty visuals, but do the research, build personas, interview customers, work on the skill set that you need to build out your UX portfolio. If you're doing it for free, you should be able to call some of the shots of what you want to do to build out your portfolio. Of course, in the end, you want to deliver a nice product for your customer. But along the way, there's a lot of activities and, and deliverables that you can use to uh, build out your portfolio. Like I said, personas, SWOT analysis. There's a lot of research methods and UX deliverables that you can use to build out your portfolio in this process. But you know, make sure you're not just showing visuals. I know we're UX research and strategy, but I assume that there might be some UX designers who are interested in this topic as well. Don't just show high-res visuals, show your process like Lori said, tell that cohesive story. And make sure that you are testing this case study that you make in the end with people. Make sure that you're showing the things that are valuable to somebody who might be hiring, like a hiring manager or a recruiter. As with anything, you wanna test your, your, your product, right? So make sure that you test your case study too. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, go wait, back. Where are you? <laughs> Wrong way. <laughs> there we go. When it comes Sorry, to soft skills, the best of me. <laughs> no worries. Happens to all of us. When it comes to soft skills, which are the most desirable or useful for a UX research position? So um, I think maybe everyone will have a different perspective. But when I'm interviewing folks, there are there are really three soft skills that I'm I'm probing about. Um, so the first one, which I I believe is really key, is organization. Um, it may seem very basic, but research has a lot, a lot, a lot of moving parts. So that you've got to manage your discussion guide. You've got to get feedback on it from different stakeholders. You've got to figure out recruitment with your participants. You've got to figure out the schedule and calendar and emails and updates. And there's just a lot to keep track of. And um, if you're managing this all yourself, you've got to be really organized in order to not um, drop the balls and to make sure that everything goes smoothly. So um, thinking proactively, thinking about the things that could go wrong and really just keeping everything straight. Um, very important as a UX researcher. Um, the second one that I think is very important is communication. It's huge. Um, communication is big, not just in research facilitation, because you know, your job is to basically talk to people. Of course, you've got to communicate verbally, but also when sharing your insights. You've got to figure out how to really use your storytelling skills to, you know, not just state your findings, but share the story of your users and what they're going through, something that really um, incites emotion and action. So communication is, is huge for researchers. And then the last one, which I think is very related, is influence. This is probably the hardest one to get, um, but I think it really matters with researchers because you want to figure out how you can share your research in a way that, like I said before, inspires action. What is the so what of your findings? How does that translate into business results? How can you get your teams to actually take your insights and make changes that are expensive sometimes? You're asking them to spend money on something. How can you use your influence to, to get those changes made in a way that you know, impacts your users? You know, how can you be the voice of the user in the meeting where they look to you as, as you know, not just um, a person that executes, uh, executes studies, but also as a, a thought partner in the product and in your users. So um, yeah, I think organization, communication, and influence for me. All right, uh, is it okay to ask about the salary range in an interview? <clears throat> and if so, when should I ask? You can ask. Um, you may or may not like what they tell you, but you should try to ask the recruiter first. Don't ask the hiring manager when you're interviewing with them. That's your time to show them how you can do this job for them, um, as well as interview them for it to be your potential new boss. Um, but the time to talk salary is when you're talking to the recruiter. Um, when they reach out to you in that, in that initial email or Zoom now, uh, phone call to talk about your interest in the position, ask the salary range at that particular moment. Ask, what is, is there a range? Can you divulge it? If so, what is it? Um, and then ask questions around what would 
influence the amount of money someone would be offered. Usually that's experience or um, degrees or, or something you're bringing to the position because what you're really wanting to know, yeah, okay, so the salary goes from $20,000 to $45,000. You really wanna know how you can get that $45,000, right? So you want to find out from the recruiter and they're the best person to ask. Um, while they will go to the hiring manager to tell them, hey, person A wants 60,000, person B wants 50,000, you know, what do you want to do? The hiring manager should look at their skills and think about how it went in that interview when they were talking with you and person B and decide which, which one is the best one. They also always have a budget to adhere to but that's why you have a range. So you want to find out what the range is so then you can put on a good show for that hiring manager. And it may be that the range is not anywhere close to what you need it to be. That's happened to me quite a few times. And I've just said to the recruiter, thanks, but no thanks. I can't take a 30% pay cut to work at your, your place. Um, good luck. Uh, finding somebody. So that's also a good um, tactic to weed out the companies who may not find UX research um, and any any of those UX positions valuable. If they're not af if they're offering the um, going rate in your area, that's a big clue that you probably will not be happy at that organization. One of the um, great resources is the UXPA salary survey. They used to do it every two years, they might be doing it every year. Just Google UXPA salary survey and it'll come up <laughs> and you should be able to look for um, all over the globe actually, they get people from Europe and other countries to answer the survey. You look up by um, years of experience, degrees, uh, female, male, gender, um, and um, also the industries that you work in um, to kind of get a good sense of what you should be asking. And my advice to you is always ask what you're worth, regardless of whether or not that place can pay it, because you will regret not asking for what you are worth later. Great. Next question. What do you expect the candidate to know about your company, the hiring manager, and the position? And yes, you should know some things about these things when you go into an interview. So what should you know about the company? Well, I would say, what industry are they in? What are the major products that they make? What do they make? Who are their competitors? Have they been in the news recently? Read up on them and see if they've been in the news. Even if it's bad reasons, you should know what you're getting into. And you should know a little bit about the company and current events. Who are the major players? Who's the CEO? Who's the founder? Who are the higher ups in this company? Also, what products do they make? And that's really important because they might ask you to redesign or give feedback on some of their products and you better know what those are going in. So know about the company, the product, the people, and why they've been in the news. What should you know about the hiring manager? Well, you should know what their name is. If you have to practice it at home, write it on your hand, make sure you know what their name is and what their title is. Like, who is this person? You want to know how long they've been at the company because you might want to ask them, which is one of my favorite questions, why do you stay with this company? So if they haven't been there very long, that might tell you something. So just know why, how long they've been there. Have some basic, I would definitely say you should stalk them on LinkedIn and know where else that they've worked. You, there's nothing wrong. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a total public site. You should know where they've worked and where they, what their path has looked like. Some, you might find some common uh, dimensions with them. Some, oh, you worked at this company or my friend worked at that company too. And those can be great connection talking points. So definitely stalk them on LinkedIn. I'd also look on social media. Have they written anything on Medium? Are they on Twitter? Are they on Instagram? Find out what they're interested in if you can and what kind of things they post about. All of these topics could be something that you could bring up in an interview that might make you look good in a positive light because you've done your research. You're a researcher, you're a UX pro. Do your research, do your homework, come in prepared. 
And then finally, what should you know about the position? Well, you should know what the job description says it is. So, because what you need to do is think about the key words that they're asking for in the job uh, description and make sure that you're explaining how you are qualified to meet those needs. If they say no Figma, you better know Figma and you bring that up in your interview. If they say they're looking for somebody who does ethnographic research, then you say that. You bring up a time where you brought that up. Talk about the methods and the things that they're asking for in the job description. I would also look up the company and see if there's anybody else that you know that works at that company. And if there is, you should talk to them and to get any insight that might be helpful for you in the interview. If you can get to people who are on that team underneath that hiring manager, that's great. Is this a place I wanna even come and work in? Get the inside scoop of the, if this is appropriate fit for you. Because with any job interview, you're not just looking for, you know, do they want you? You wanna also find out, do you want to be there? And then finally, make sure you understand what kind of tools, what kind of setup, are they agile? Are they in pods? Are they, co are they co you know, co-located? Or I mean, we're all dispersed now in the line of COVID, but what is their setup? How do they work together? How, how does research play in with everybody else's roles? What do those partnerships look like? Understand some of those team dynamics can be really helpful. And it's okay not to know. If you do find some of that out through research by talking to other companies, that's, or sorry, other people who work at that company, that's great. But keep in mind, you kind of want to flesh some of these details out too. So come in prepared to ask some questions around the team dynamics, the company dynamics, that sort of thing as well. So how do you talk about when you're not sure if your research actually made a difference? So this is an interesting question because I think this can happen for a couple of different reasons. So one, I'm assuming that this is either talking about a portfolio piece or a case study. So first of all, if you do have an example where you have proven results, like choose that one instead, that would be very helpful. So when it comes to selecting your case studies, like be really thoughtful on how you select them um, and results is a, is a great um, one to showcase, like when you've got results. Um, the second thing is, if you think you might have business results or they might exist, but maybe you don't know the results either because you've moved off the team or you've left the company or you're on a different project, like, you know, a lot of times we're doing so much research where you've done research, you deliver the results, you hand it over to the team, hopefully you've influenced them to make changes, but then you're, you're on to the next project, right? Um, if you're still in contact with that person or have the ability to get in contact with them, like ask them, what are the results of this? Hey, I know we did some research a few months ago or last year, like, you know, what happened? Um, if you're not at the company, like Jen said, like LinkedIn is your friend, it's public and, and people love to talk about their successful projects. So, um, bring it up and, and see if you can dig up some results. Um, so I know that those two didn't really address the question, but those are some things that you might think of outside the box. Um, but if you really don't have an example where you have influenced the product design or business results, maybe because like it actually didn't, it, like you were on the project, you know what happened. Maybe they said, oh, these are great findings, but we've actually changed priorities. Like how often does that happen at your company? Um, I'll just say like, be honest, you know, don't, don't make anything up. Um, you can say something like, you know, I'm not sure what the result was because our team actually went a different way. We reorged and different things happen. But what you should do is like flip that and say, but the results I delivered um, opened up this opportunity and that opportunity was this based on the findings. And our hypothesis was if we were to do this and this would happen. And if this was still a project that was going on, what I would want to measure is this thing. So although we didn't get to see the results, here's what my plan was to try to find the results. So almost turn it into a hypothetical. Um, and then like, I think my last suggestion would be just be like to dig a little bit deeper, even some projects that maybe don't have results or, you know, as a researcher, I know like I've made a ton of mistakes. Maybe you botched it a little bit. There's always, always something you can learn from it, even if it's not directly tied to a specific result. So for example, you could say something like, you know, um, during this project, you know, it didn't go much further than the research, but I learned a lot more about our business and users. And as a result, I was a better partner on my team, which then helped later projects. And uh, because I, I learned this 
insight, I was able to probe deeper and get better insights for another project, which led to this result. And so, you know, take it beyond the, this insight led to this action and think about like, what are some of the ripple effects or some of the um, secondary benefits that your research uh, provided? All right, so we do have um, a couple bonus questions and this is up for grabs for anybody. So what are the greatest sins when it comes to UX research strategy and design resumes? What do y'all think? I'm gonna go first. I have some very specific ones that I am not a fan of. First, I don't wanna see your photo on a resume. I'm sure you're lovely, but no, it leads to a lot of bias and it, unless you're absolutely gorgeous, which only <laughs> Lauren is. It, no, oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Unless you're absolutely gorgeous, no. All seriousness, don't put a photo on your resume. Also, I see this a lot on design resumes. Don't put charts that say 80 Figma, 70 Slack, 50 ethnographic research, 45 usability tests. What does that even mean? Those what numbers, is the scale? What is the scale? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Are you saying you've done it for 45 days? 45% of your day is done in that? You are only 45% efficient. Well, how do you know? So I can't- and why would you say that about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you saying? So I'm telling you, every UX pro who, well, I won't say every, that's generalizing. UX people discriminate and examine things like that. So when you give somebody a, a ambiguous stat like that, they're good, the first thing is, what does this mean? Like, you know, Lauren said, what are, what are you measuring here? What is this? So just don't do it. Leave the charts off. Who else? I, I think um, the, the charts is definitely one of my biggest pet peeves. Like you said, like, I don't know the scale and like, why would you highlight something you're not good at? So like, usually it's people saying they're 10 out of 10 of everything and maybe a nine out of 10 on something. So um, I, I definitely don't think that's helpful. Um, the other thing I, I really don't like is like the tiniest, tiniest text and, blo and, and blocks of text. <laughs> Like part of your job as um, a designer, a person in UX or, or research is to distill the information into the most important pieces and to synthesize something into, into a cohesive story that is understandable and like quickly understood. And so like show that on your resume, like have things um, uh, laid out in a way that makes it easy to follow along with the story and have only the most important pieces that like Jen mentioned earlier, like directly tie into um, the job description that you want. Yeah. And conversely, if you're at a job for three years and you only have three bullet points under that job entry, I'm going to really wonder what the heck you've been doing for three years. Because I've seen that. And I was like, I don't, I wouldn't talk to this person. Obviously, they weren't either doing much or they cannot tell me what they're doing. How could they be effective in communicating findings from a research project? If they cannot communicate effectively about themselves. So definitely scrutinize the information that you put in your resume for each job. Your resume is not LinkedIn. It's not the same thing. <laughs> LinkedIn, you can blab all you want about all the things that you've done. Your resume needs to be very focused on the job you're applying for, so if you're coming in to be a researcher or a designer, I don't need to know that you nannied in Europe for two years. That does not have any applicableness to, to this, unless you're coming to design for kids, maybe, maybe then. Um, so make sure that you're only picking the most salient information to put on that resume. I am the outlier. I will read your whole entire resume. But unfortunately, that has to get through my recruiter first before I will read the whole thing. So that's the first level of, of defense is this recruiter. So you've got to put the information that they are looking for in that resume. And the time, time for these 7.4 seconds. Yeah. And recruiter gives a resume. And if you wow. are going to a place that has like those optical scanners, I just date myself optical scanners, um, where they scan the resume and they look for the keywords. And if your keywords are not keywords, you don't get picked. And there are 500 people applying for that job. So make sure you're using the words that are in the job description um, and, and you're 
you're talking to that job description. You're trying to sell yourself to that job description. Whether or not the job description is a magical unicorn, <laughs> that's a diet topic for a different day, but you do want to sell yourself to that position. I have a couple more little ones. Yeah. And we can debate this. Uh, I don't need to see your home address. I don't think that's really mm -hmm. relevant. Um, I don't want a funny email. I had a you know somebody whose email was Sally is a loser at gmail.com. No, 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 oh, no. Get a professional sounding uh, email. <laughs> Emails are free. <laughs> this should go without saying, but I have seen this. Do not have a silly, goofy email. Get a professional sounding email with your name in it. Also, do not put your references on your resume. References should be a separate page. I get it. If you don't have a lot of experience, you're trying to fill it up. It shows when you put your references on there. So don't do it. And I'm not a huge fan of personal interests. I think you could start with that when you're fresh out of school, but if you're working 10 years in and you're putting in that, you, you know, you're knitting and you're hiking and you're baking cakes, that's nice, but I, I'm, I'm not hiring you to bake a cake. You might be my you best friend. Okay, Jen, I have, <laughs> right. I have two follow-up questions for you. Yes. So two follow-up questions. I agree about the home address. I don't think I need your exact address. And sometimes having like that personal information makes me nervous, like with security right. stuff. What are your thoughts on just having like the city and state? I think that's fine, especially where you're, you can see the city and state where the jobs have been. Like, yep. I have that on mine, you know, <laughs> Plano, Texas, yeah. Los Angeles, California. I think that that's fine. I think that those locations are going to start to become irrelevant with more remote um, yeah. positions. So I was just going to say, at GitLab, we don't care where you live. Within reason, I guess we do some, some people, but like, I don't care that you used to work in California and now you're in Texas. I care, can you do the job? Um, so yeah, it's kind it's of irrelevant. Times. Yeah, it's different yeah, times. Yeah. People move for different reasons, right? It's not a poor reflection for you to move from one state no. to another yeah. by any means. I'm so also second really question. Finicky. Oh, go ahead. I'm also really finicky about typos, grammar, yeah. to have another set of eyes, look at it. You know, capitalization should be consistent. Don't have two spaces after a period. We are not on typewriters anymore. This is just me. I get caught up in those little details. So, well, I think you're pointing out something good. Like a, a lot of design professionals are looking at your resume. So, like mm -hmm. a lot of design professionals are detail oriented, and those things matter. And um, so, pay attention, read it, have someone else read it. Do not come with a typo or a mis you know, capital capitalization or anything. Definitely. Yeah. What was your next question? My second question was, you know, I also agree with you about the personal interest thing. Sometimes I read it and I'm like, that's cool, I guess. But how, like, how do you recommend people show their personalities through the resume? Like if at all? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I want your personality in your resume to be quite honest. I, yeah. I, he, I'm hiring, I'm interested in you because of your skill set and what your resume yeah. says. I'll get your personality in our interview. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get a good, you know, a good culture fit then, I think. Yeah. yeah. And that goes like along that. with my pet peeve of strange fonts. Don't do it. <laughs> just stick with Arial or Courier or whatever. Just, just, just don't even. And I have seen some crazy stuff and especially from designers and I'm like I get it your designer I'm looking forward to your portfolio where you show me your design skills I do not need them here in your resume so yeah I have one more question for you guys and I was going to ask it in a biased way but I will not because I can be a researcher <laughs> and not how many pages should the resume be well there is a difference between a resume and a cv because a CV is what they do in Europe, and it might be 30 pages. And in academia. It is, yeah, it's supposed to be all of your stuff from ever, um, especially if you publish, and uh, it's all of that in there. So that's over there. Uh, we're just talking about resumes. Um, I, I'm a weird, I think I'm an outlier. Like, I want 
to understand what your experience is. I'm going to go all the way back to the first job you put on that resume so I can understand what your history has been. Because I might ask you, like for me, I started in education. I'm going to put the fact that I used to work basically an IT job at, at the education level because it's important. And I'm going to put the time that I was at the, the school district office because that shows leadership skills because I was leading teams of teachers to do technology work. So I'm not putting everything that I did at those jobs anymore like I used to when it was 10 years ago, but I'm still putting the entry of that job and then taking the salient pieces of like, I have led teams, I have made budget decisions for the district. That is what I did there. And those are very important to me. So my resume, I think is like three pages but I start with the most recent job first, and that's what goes on the front page. And that's where the meat of what my experience is, is there in those first two or three jobs. So if you don't ever flip through the, the next two pages, it's okay. I already told you my story as a UX person. But if you do, you get an expanded view of my, my job world. Yeah, I may be a bit old school on this. I'm a one page resume kind of gal. Um, I like to see how people can get creative and, and, and putting things on a single page, but I don't think I knock people if they send me like a two page thing and, uh, chances are I'll skim the second page. Cause I'm hoping they'll put the most important stuff on the first page. Um, but if it gets to be to the four or five page range, I'm starting to think that this person doesn't know how to synthesize the information and, and give me the most important stuff up front. So, um, you know, especially a more junior person who doesn't have all the years experience. I'm like, well, you just wrote me pages about like this single job that you did, which is great. And I'm sure I'll find out about that in the interview and in the portfolio review, but it's not for a resume. Well, I Jen, am in the thoughts? middle. Yeah. I'm a two pager <laughs> kind of gal. And uh, I, I'm just basing it on my own, working for 20 plus years. Uh, I, has it been 20 years? Yeah, we're going to pretend I didn't just say that. Math. <laughs> uh, <laughs> clearly math is not on one of my pages. Uh, and I have, a, I have a lot of experience and my journey is, is from day one where Lori transitioned out, and Lauren too transitioned. I'm design and, and journalism from day one. So those you know, journalism is a strong and, and strongly related field to UX. So I want to illustrate that path. Like I worked at a newspaper. I had my butt disciplined with a daily deadline. So I know deadlines are real, but I, I used to have one, but after a few years of experience and I, you know, showcasing my skill set and some of my, you know, speaking engagements and that sort of thing, it's grown to two, but I am to Lauren's point, prioritizing the information and making sure that it sticks to two yeah. and really editing it down. Well, you know, I think these are all good points too. Like Jen, you mentioned like the average recruiter spends what, seven, what was seven, it? What was your 7.4 seconds is the stat I seconds. read. Seconds. Second. Yeah. So if like, so to Lori's point, like if you've got a longer resume, just like make sure the important stuff is up front. Cause you've got seven seconds to have someone be the make or break before you can even get to the hiring manager. And scannable, scannable bullets, yeah. not paragraphs. That I think to me that mm -hmm. is key is that it needs to be really scannable. I see too yeah. much. I'm not a reader. I'm not like Lori. I, you're lucky if you're getting point four seconds. So you better like. I'm a yeah. scanner too. You grab me because <laughs> I, I need the info very quickly. Are we all good with the Are we ready to move on to the second bonus question? Yes. All right. What are the greatest sins when it comes to UX research strategy and design portfolios? Yes. And I did a uh, hour and a half long uh, workshop that's on our Vimeo channel as well on portfolios. And I highly suggest you check it out. Um, it, it does cost a couple dollars, but it is worth it. Um, go in depth into portfolios and, and how to structure them and what you should put in there. Um, but lately, um, the sins that I have seen in portfolios are rambling, just rambles. Like the, I get lost. Like you're going to present this to me as a senior person on your to be team. 
and you are going to ramble your way through your job history. That's not what a portfolio should be. Portfolio is your time to shine, your time to tell me a cohesive story about work that you have done and tell me why that is a transferable skill to what you might be doing at my current company. Um, we, I hire people who don't necessarily work in IT. So I work at GitLab and we work with DevOps all the time and system admins, but we've hired people from TripAdvisor. You know, that is not, you know, a DevOps kind of place, but you told me a good story about the work that you did that was very complex and the methods and strategies that you used to distill your information and how you sold it to your stakeholders in a way that convinced me that you would be good on the team that I work on, even though we work with a dev very technical crowd. That's what I'm looking for in a portfolio. Um, the other sin that I've seen people do is you, I'm only talking to you for 45 minutes and you take 35 minutes to go through your portfolio. Now I have 10 minutes for questions. And I have passed this on to my other colleagues who then will interview you. And I'll say, don't do the portfolio review. It took too long. I need these questions answered. So it, the way that we do it at GitLab is there's a set of questions and we're all responsible for getting answers to those questions as a team. So if I can't get to anything but one question, that puts the burden on my other team members who need to get questions answered from this interviewee. Um, so don't, don't, don't do that. Use the time wisely, be succinct, um, stick to the point. You can show pictures of your work um, as long as there's no PII, uh, personal identifiable information in there. Um, so mock-ups and stuff are fine. Talk to me about them, because I've seen that too. But the best one is like, it's like this tiny, and then the screen's this big. I'm like, I don't even know why you put that in there, because I can't see anything on there. Um, and maybe you do it because I'm not supposed to see it, like you're not supposed to show it. Um, but it's doing yourself a disservice when you could have used clip art or something else to illustrate the points that you want to communicate to me instead of using like a thumbnail size of some screen that you tested. Um, Jen, what are some of your pet peeves? Sure. Um, something Lori, or sorry, Lauren mentioned earlier, don't lie. Don't mm -hmm. steal somebody else's images and put them in your portfolio. That can actually be tracked, backtracked, and they can, and I have heard of stories where they will, uh, somebody will get a portfolio, they'll backtrack where those images came from and contact the person that the images were stolen from. Don't do that. Don't, that is not a good way to start this whole thing. Also, don't lie about your role in the process. If you were just the researcher or you just did the usability test, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't pretend like you came up with the strategy and you mocked up all the things and you did the wireframes. Oh, don't don't do that. If you didn't write the discussion guide, but you did conduct the interviews and you did assist in the, in the analysis, that's okay. Speak to what you actually did because if you don't, you're going to get caught and you don't want to be setting off this relationship on the wrong foot. It's not worth getting busted. So just don't lie about what you've done. Don't lie about your work. Be honest. People will appreciate your honesty more. And, well, and you're able to talk to it for real. Like if people yeah. start to ask you probing questions, like maybe you, it's a little white light as a little exaggeration and someone's really interested and they're like, oh, so tell me how you came up with that. And then you're having to like dig yourself deeper into more lies because you didn't actually come up with it. So honesty is the best policy because exactly like Jen said, it will come up. Right. Also, I would say if you are a designer, don't just show pretty mock-ups. You start with that. And then you're gonna tell your cohesive story, like Lori said, of how you got there, whatever research methods you did or you, your research methods to the mock-ups or whatever that might be, but they wanna see your process. This is what UX people are looking for. So if you think you're just gonna show portfolio of dribble designs one after another, that is not gonna get you in the, in the, in the seat. You're gonna to need to be able to speak to your process. So high res mock-ups are not gonna be enough 
even a whole bunch of them are not going to be enough to tell your story of the of the of the process of how it was and you you can use this that star framework right situation tasks actions and results as your as the way to guide and structure that case study another little tiny thing if you are having a case study and a pdf is okay we could debate that too guys we can talk about that um, on every slide do include your name your your name and some kind of contact information in case it in case somebody prints it out and it gets like kind of distributed or whatnot do include the contact information on your case study too yeah i, I have, have to oh go ahead go ahead jen finish it out. one yeah. more um does what we get this, this question a lot what what platform you know can it be a pdf does it have to be a website can i print it out well it you don't need to print it out like who's printing out now i, I don't even have a printer at home um, but it could be a pdf so that you could bail it or whatnot also you know there's platforms like weebly wordpress squarespace that have a lot of templates that you can just get up and running and use insert your your product your you know your project in there don't spend years months and forever on building the portfolio do something scrappy refine it later but just get it up and, and have something to show and make it mobile friendly. Uh, a lot of those I mentioned like Weebly and Squarespace are responsive. So, uh, and they adjust the design for you. You don't have to know a lot of code to do that, especially, you know, a researcher. Not, if you're not a front end developer, get one of those frameworks that has these templates kind of built up for you that you just plug in your case study and your work into there. Yeah. Lauren? Yeah, so I have, I was going to say I have two, but you made me think of a third one. So um, one kind of like Gloria said was like, use your time wisely and do your research to figure out what the format is because different companies do portfolio uh, reviews different ways. So, you know, Lori mentioned how her company does it. Other companies may say like you have an hour and a half and the time is yours to choose, or maybe it's you have an hour to present and 30 minutes for Q&A. Maybe you only have 10 minutes to present, 20 minutes for Q&A. Like find that out ahead of time, because what, what we want to see in your portfolio, um, especially if it's an in-person portfolio review, is a very, very polished presentation. We want to see you walk us through and guide us through your best work, your best self, and use the time exactly, you know, how you intend to. And, and that's the thing is like how you want us to see you. So you design what your portfolio presentation should be. Um, so do your homework. Your recruiter should tell you what the format is and how much time you have and who all will be there. Um, definitely do that. The next portfolio or the next pet peeve I have is when um, people don't do the polished presentation or, or don't put together a cohesive story and they'll show you their website and be like, well, what are y'all interested in seeing? It's like, well, why are you putting this on me? Like you're supposed to be showing me your best work. So don't, um, don't, you know, give people very many options. And if you only have 20 minutes, like pick one, if you have 40 minutes, maybe you can pick two, but in, what you don't want to happen is like, what, you know, through halfway through your portfolio review, you realize you don't have enough time. And then you're, you say, okay, well, which one do you want to see next? And then they're like, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about your work. And it makes a really awkward conversation um, that has happened. Uh, more times uh, than I can count. Um, so you're basically with those two, like you are in control, you are presenting, you are designing your story that you want to tell me. So like, think about it and be intentional. Um, the last one is similar to what Jen said is I, if I'm looking at a, like doing a, a pre-read of a portfolio, I tend to move past the ones that do only show polished work. I want to see the process. I want to see the sketches. I want to see pictures of people affinitizing sticky notes. I want to see you affinitizing sticky notes. Like I am looking for the messy, the ugly. I'm looking for the collaboration with your teammates. Um, and I'm looking for different artifacts throughout the process to tell me the story of how you got from point A to point B and what your thought process was. So it, you know, you should tell me um, and this is probably the strategic part of it is you should tell me where you started, the things that you did to get, to get me to this end point or this middle point, but somewhere better than where you started. Um, yeah, those are my pet peeves. So let me ask you a kind of controversial, 
and this is less about a case study, but more about like an online portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear people say, well, I was in fashion design and that's very much like UX because I was thinking about the customer or I was a graphic designer or an illustrator and that's very much like UX because of whatever reason. So what they're trying to do is show their past and how it relates to the UX future, right? So you hear, show your portfolio or you, you know, sh say, show where you want to go not so much where you have been. Have you I guys heard that? Like it, I have, show the work that you like display the work you want to do, apply for the job you want to do versus what you've done in the past. What are your you thoughts apply on that? You to the job that you want to do, but you need to show me what you've done in the past in order to get that job that you want. So if you have done work in fashion, let's say, you say it's UX based, well, tell me what you did. Who did you talk to? What was the problem? What did you find out? How did you use that fashion, whatever you were doing, the job in the fashion industry to solve that problem that you uncovered? That speaks in UX language. And I'm very interested in hearing about that. I am not interested in hearing about how tangerine's the new color and you designed everything in tangerine. That does not speak to me about a user-centered design process. You've designed nothing based on the needs of the user other than maybe the tangerine manufacturers. Um, so that, that's what I need people who are switching industries to, to do. They've got to bridge that gap between, I did this in a different industry, but I applied the UCD principles to the process that I went through. That is going to get you further past the recruiter because you're telling that story to the recruiter. You're not even telling that to me or the hiring manager yet. You're still trying to get your foot in the door, especially if you're switching from industries. And again, caveat, never lie. Don't make it up. If you didn't do it, you didn't do it. Yeah, I, I'm definitely with you on this one, Lori. Like one, don't lie, you'll get caught. And two, like I don't want to hear about in your portfolio, what you wish you had done or what you would do next time if you were to do it differently. I, I want to see concrete examples of what you did. Um, just like in research, you're not, you, you know, you don't ask people about future behavior because people are terrible fortune tellers about their own behavior. You want to, like, the way you find out about, uh, or what, what do they say, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And so give me concrete examples of what you did. And you know what, maybe your old job was not a UX research design job, but if you truly actually did apply user-centered approaches, like show that. If you didn't, then it sounds like you need to find um, maybe some volunteer or some other, uh, other examples of, of what you could do to actually do it. Um, yeah, that's my stance on it. Great. Anybody else have any other feedback on portfolios? Well, clearly we had a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's even bonus more questions. That, you know, there's even more in the uh, portfolio uh, webinar up on Vimeo. Trust me, go into all of this in much more detail, especially like what to show, what not to show, how to get around NDAs, should you even get around NDAs, all that stuff. Yeah, another huge plug for that, Lori, like we've gotten so much great feedback from our survey results and social media, um, huge praise for the, the portfolio um, webinar. So definitely check it out on our Vimeo. Yeah. So and, again, yeah. thank you very much for supporting North, for supporting us in North Texas Giving Day. Without your donations and your support, we would not be, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be able to provide our events for free and make our events go global now that we're in the age of COVID. And every little bit counts to keep us going. We're all volunteers as well. We do not get a cut of this, of the nope. proceeds. So thank you so much. And we hope you enjoyed this little bonus footage as a thank you for all of your support that you've done for North Texas Giving Day and hopefully beyond. So we'll see you next time. Thank you all very much. Sounds good. Thank Bye. you guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye.